What about the organisms that live in those different areas? These pelagic organisms out in the, the uh, uh, ocean water. Well, you have plankton. These are floating organisms. And you can have phytoplankton, which includes plants and plant-like organisms that perform photosynthesis. So when I say plant-like organisms, I'm including things like bacteria that uh, do photosynthesize and um, just kind of float around out in the ocean. You also have zooplankton, and these include um, uh, things like foraminifera, tiny mollusks, well, crustaceans, um, larvae of many invertebrates, like uh, corals and stuff. They uh, just float around, but these are not photosynthetic. Um, then we have the necton. The necton are your swimming organisms. And so that'll be shrimp, cephalopods like octopus, it's going to be fish, it's going to be your marine um, mammals like whales and dolphins. These guys can actually decide where they're going to go, right? They are swimming. The plankton, they've just got to float wherever the water takes them. So when we look at our, um, our pelagic organisms, right out here we have the continental shelf. That's where our photic zone penetrates all the way to the bottom of the uh, uh, ocean, right, to the sea floor. But then we move out into the deeper waters, and there we get down here where there's no light or limited light, but we do still have many organisms living in that area. So those are the pelagic organisms, but we also have the ones that live on the sea floor, right, our benthic organisms. When we talk about benthic ecosystems, well, you have um, the supratidal zone. This is above high tide, but it's still where you get some ocean water hitting because you get sea spray as the waves um, hit rock or sediment. Some of it uh, sprays upwards and will hit this area. The littoral zone is the area between high and low tide. So this is an area that's underwater at high tide, above water at low tide. It can be a challenging place for organisms to live because of the constantly fluctuating waters. The sublittoral zone, this is the low tide at the edge of the continental shelf. As I said, the photic zone reaches the seafloor, and we have lots of life there. Lots of organisms are living on the bottom of the sea in this area. And then the deep water zones, right, we're getting deeper where there's limited or no light, and it's going to be cold. We're going to have high water pressure because it's so deep. And here you have what's called the bathyal, abyssal, and hadal zones. So getting to uh, some of the deepest parts of the ocean. And that's what we're seeing here, right? There's the continental shelf where most of the life just loves living. And then we get to those really deep parts of the ocean. All right, with our benthic organisms, our organisms that hang out living on the sea floor, you can have epifaunal organisms. They live on the seafloor, but then you can have the infaunal organisms. They burrow into the seafloor. And these burrowers cause something called bioturbation. So normally, as sediment accumulates, we get those little layers of sediment, right? Which we call either beds or laminations. Well, what bioturbation does when they dig in and burrow in, they can actually destroy the primary uh, beds and layers and really just churn up the sediment. And so it's kind of uh, um, finding this bioturbation can let us know that we had lots of these burrowing in faunal organisms. All right, in the deep marine environments, we do get sediment accumulating. So if you remember from physical geology, you have uh, terrigenous sediment in the oceans, which comes from the continents. If we look at our map right here, the, the sediment from the continents is in this kind of brown-orange color. And notice it's right next to the continents, right? Because it's being washed off the land. But we do get other sediment 
pelagic sediment accumulating in the deeper oceans. And one of these sediments that accumulates out there is called siliceous ooze. Now remember, siliceous means silica, or you can think of the mineral quartz. And siliceous ooze is made of the tests of diatoms or radiolaria. And um, the term tests means the tiny shells of these things. So if an organism has a tiny, tiny, almost microscopic shell, we call it a test. So these, these little uh, shells of the diatoms and radiolaria, they will accumulate in the deeper ocean zones where you don't get other sediments. And that's in green. So you can see in these green areas, that's where we get our siliceous ooze. And um, they accumulate where there's lots of nutrients, abundant nutrients, and these nutrients allow these little siliceous organisms to just be happy and thrive in those areas. Now, if you notice, we also have this blue area here, right, that's in many parts of the ocean. And that's calcareous ooze. You might be thinking, why do we call it ooze? Well, when you get this sediment off the sea floor and you touch it, it's like kind of icky. And so we call it ooze. It's like this sort of slippery, icky kind of thing. Well, in blue, that's our calcareous ooze. And this is the tests and skeletons of things like coccoliths, which geologists get tired of saying, we just call them coccoliths. So it's the uh, coccoliths, foraminifera, and uh, a weird little organism, this kind of snail uh, called pteropods. I think it's like a odd swimming snail type organism, something like that. But anyway, these guys all have um, carbonate shells. And it's calcareous. Whenever you hear that, you should be thinking calcite or a carbonate mineral. And these accumulate in waters less than 4,000 meters deep. They will not accumulate in deeper waters. And the reason for that is something called the carbonate compensation depth, which we abbreviate CCD. Now, why won't these things accumulate in deep waters? Well, the CCD is the water depth at which calcium carbonate, calcite, uh, accumulation rate equals the rate of dissolution. So that means what happens as these little organisms die and their shells start to sink to the bottom of the ocean, it reaches this depth and those shells start getting dissolved away. The reason they get dissolved is because this cold, deeper water holds more dissolved um, carbon dioxide. And when carbon dioxide gets dissolved in water, it makes the water acidic. And the actual depth varies of the CCD, um, but it's usually between about 4,000 and 5,000 meters. And so you cannot get any carbonate minerals accumulating in those deeper ocean areas because the water is too acidic and will dissolve that material away. Okay, other uses of fossils that we're going to see over the course of the semester. We can use them to develop paleogeography. Uh, um, they can tell us where were the locations of land, where the, were the locations of forests or rivers or things, because different types of organisms live in different places. It can also show us how organisms migrate over time, or maybe where the plates were located. We can also do paleoclimatology because certain organisms require certain climatic conditions to live. A great example are corals. Um, your typical corals um, thrive where you have warm water and the water temperature does not drop below 18 degrees uh, Celsius or about 65 degrees Fahrenheit. So in the past, when the climate was much warmer than it is today, corals actually lived at higher latitudes than they do now because it was warmer at uh, farther north and farther south, right, closer to the poles. So corals had a wider range than they do now. And um, that's because of the temperature. Well, how do we figure out, though, 
with uh, uh, any kind of accuracy, ancient ocean temperatures or ancient temperatures in general. Because later on in this semester, I'll be telling you, like, uh, in the Cretaceous, um, it was a greenhouse world, significantly warmer than it is today. Um, how do I know these kinds of things? Well, one of the ways we can figure out, for instance, ocean temperatures of the distant past are oxygen isotopes. So oxygen has stable isotopes, unchanging. They are not radioactive like, say, uranium isotopes. And what we do is we look at the ratio of the oxygen 16 to oxygen 18. And we call this the delta 18O. So if you ever see that, that just means this oxygen 16 to 18 ratio. So how does this work? As water evaporates from the oceans, the lighter oxygen isotope evaporates faster. In the, the atmosphere preferentially e evaporates oxygen-16. If it's cold, glaciers are going to be growing, and some of this precipitation is going to fall on those glaciers and get trapped there, right? It's going to get stuck in those glaciers, and that's going to lock up the, the oxygen-16, and that increases the relative amount of the heavier oxygen isotope in seawater. So we can then look at the shells of organisms that were living in the seawater. They will take up the oxygen to create their shells. We can look at the isotopes in there and it gives us an idea, was it warmer or was it colder when those little organisms lived? And so that's uh, uh, an important way that we can figure out ancient ocean temperatures. Okay, fossils are all about life, right? So let's take a look at the earliest life. We have chemical signatures of life in rocks dating all the way back to 3.8 billion years ago. And I, I believe that's up in Greenland, some of these chemical signatures of life. But it isn't an actual fossil. It's just like, oh, carbon with the right uh, um, um, bonds and stuff is in there. But it's not actually a fossil preserved. So the earliest actual real fossils preserved are these prokaryotic, that means those primitive uh, cells with no... Um, uh, nucleus, no organelles. We have these, uh, these prokaryotic microbial organisms uh, are preserved in rocks about 3.5 billion years old. So that's how long ago we have definite fossils of life. Now as far as multicellular life, uh, that's around 1 billion years ago we have definite multicellular life. Um, uh, and I do say definite because there are some that might be a bit older, but there is some debate on whether it's a big single cell or um, a early multicellular organism. And we're going to finish off our, um, our lecture on fossils by looking at some of the main groups of fossils that uh, exist that you will, uh, or that we will be talking about throughout the rest of the lectures. So we have, uh, we're going to start with Kingdom Animalia. And this is phylum protozoa. These are single cells or groups of cells. And this counts as the foraminifera, radiolarians, and fusilinids. Um, these are um, some of these, these uh, protozoa. These are some foraminifera. Um, they're actually an index fossil for the late Paleozoic, for the Pennsylvanian uh, and Permian. We have uh, phylum Archaeocyatha. These guys look a lot like a sponge. They're a very primitive organism. They have this little holdfast that holds them on the ground. Um, they were um, kind of a filter feeder. They only lived in the Cambrian. They're one of the few phylum that have totally gone extinct. And we have phylum porifera. These are sponges. They're very simple. They have no organ systems. And we have fossils of these sponge uh, organisms going all the way back into the Precambrian. And we will learn a little bit more in detail about these different organisms um, as, as we have uh, more lectures later in the semester. 
Uh, phylum Nadaria. This includes corals and jellyfish. And um, they have kind of two stages that they might live in. Uh, the polyp stage creates the reefs. If you ever go snorkeling or scuba diving, you see all these beautiful coral reefs. That's uh, Nadaria polyps. There's also a medusoid stage. Those are the jellyfish that kind of float around. And um, in the Paleozoic, the corals made their, their reefs out of calcite. Modern corals make it out of aragonite. Uh, bryozoans are sort of like corals. They are these um, organisms that um, they're colonial. They will build a structure like this. That's our bryozoan colony. You see all those little dots in there? That's where the little bryozoan animal lives. Um, they're similar to corals, but they have more complex organ systems. So for example, in a coral, its mouth is also its anus. But in a bryozoan, it has a complete digestive tract. So it has a mouth, it goes through the, it eats, it goes through the whole digestive tract, and it has a separate anus from its mouth. Phylum Brachiopoda. Brachiopods are these uh, shelled organisms that were very common in the Paleozoic. Uh, so they're bivalves, meaning two shells. They have, the shells are not the same as each other. See how they have a slightly different shape? And these organisms would um, fasten themselves, they're benthic, they fasten themselves to the sea floor and basically uh, live on the sea floor. Another benthic organism is um, uh, uh, these crinoids, which look like this. They are part of phylum echinodermata. So they would live on the sea floor and just be sitting around there, but they are related to things like starfish and sand dollars, which move around. So some of these phylum have very different tactics, you know, they live different lifestyles depending on which organism in the phylum we exactly have. These guys have five-fold symmetry and um, they're, uh, they're, these, these crinoid things, they're still alive today, but they were most abundant uh, really in like the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian times. They grew all over the place. Phylum mollusca is very varied. Uh, molluscas include polysopods, which are clams, uh, gastropods, which are snails, and cephalopods, which are these things. Um, uh, things like cephalopods include extinct organisms like ammonites, but they also include extant organisms, organisms still living, like octopus. Octopus are cephalopods. I like octopus. They're really cool and smart. Uh, phylum Annelida are segmented worms. Phylum Arthropoda is another one of these very diverse phylum. Uh, they have uh, jointed appendages and a skeleton, an exoskeleton made of chitin. And it includes everything like crabs today, lobsters, insects, but also these organisms, trilobites. They are extinct today, but they were, again, one of these organisms that was very, very abundant in the Paleozoic. Uh, phylum Hemichordata, uh, these are called graptolites. They are important index fossils in the early Paleozoic. Conodonts we're going to talk about later because they were these very confusing little teeth-like uh, fossils. Uh, they're very tiny. That's one millimeter right there. And conodonts can be important index fossils, but they can also be actually important in oil exploration. Um, and uh, I'll talk more about that when we go into detail about conodonts. Phylum vertebrata is what we belong to. All vertebrates have a notochord and backbone, right? That's important in our nervous system. And this includes Pisces, which are fish, amphibians, which include things like frogs and toads, reptiles, like my Coelophysis dinosaur right there. Coelophysis is the state fossil of New Mexico. Aves are birds, and mammals are, of course, things like us and my cats that are running around the house causing chaos right now. 
Hey, when it comes to plants, plants are also important fossils that we uh, have throughout time. Kingdom Plantae includes blue-green algae, which belong to cyanophyta. We also have chlorophyta, which are green algae. We have phaophyta, which are brown algae. I bet you never thought there were so many different colors of algae out there. Uh, why are brown algae brown? Because they contain something called fucoxanthin. You don't actually need to know that, but it's kind of cool. Uh, red algae exist, and they contain a different pigment that makes them red. All right, so that was all the algae. We also have other plants that, um, that are important. We have bryophytes, which are mosses and liverworts. These are the plants that grow very close to the ground because they're non-vascular. They have no way of lifting water above the ground, so they have to stay close to the ground to, uh, to their water source. We have division Coelophyta, and uh, these guys have a very primitive va vascular system to start lifting um, like water and nutrients upwards. Um, still, you would not call it like your modern plants. Um, they do exist today, but they are very primitive. They lack roots and leaves. Now, Lycophyta, again, have a primitive vascular system that allows them to start growing a little bit higher than your, um, than your mosses do. Uh, they reproduce by spores. Horsetails. Uh, horsetails still uh, live today, but they, uh, you could have also seen horsetails um, back in the uh, Paleozoic. And uh, they have segmented stems, they have a vascular system, so now they can be growing taller because this vascular system allows the plant to lift water and nutrients uh, above the ground. Uh, Terophyta are ferns and they reproduce by spores, ferns that were again incredibly common in the Paleozoic. I've eaten some ferns, they're tasty. Uh, division Teridospermatophyta, these are seed ferns. These were quite common in the late Paleozoic, but they are extinct today. They're one of the few plant um, uh, uh, divisions that has, uh, has gone extinct. Cycatophyta, these are cycads. You'll probably see a lot of them around here. People plant them here uh, as ornamental um, uh, plants. They were very abundant in the age of the dinosaurs, in the Mesozoic. You had a lot of uh, these cycads growing. Ginkgos are living fossils. Uh, ginkgos uh, have this very unique leaf shape and they date all the way back to the Paleozoic, and they're pretty much unchanged since the Paleozoic. Uh, they also are very tolerant of pollution, so a lot of cities plant ginkgo trees because they, uh, they'll live in the uh, kind of smoggier, nastier city air. Um, so that's ginkgos. Conifers are another old group. They date back to the uh, Paleozoic. Conifers reproduce via cones. The most common ones you'll see are things like your pine trees. And then there's flowering plants. Flowering plants are actually evolutionarily quite new on our planet. Uh, they only show up in the Mesozoic, and not even the early Mesozoic. They show up in the later Mesozoic. And um, so for much of Earth's history, there were no flowers on the planet. Uh, but Anthophyta, that's our flowering plants that are incredibly diverse today. And there's my random picture of the day. That is a Tyrannosaurus rex skull. That's a dinosaur that bit me. Um, we were moving that, and I know my husband will deny this fact, but he dropped the head on me, and uh, I happened to be on the front end like that, and I, I got a dinosaur tooth in my skull. Uh, so yeah, I've been bitten by a dinosaur, imagine that.